Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Accessibility and Landscape It's Time to Take Action webinar. In an era where 15% of the world's population faces some form of disability, there's never been a time more important than now to ensure landscape design incorporates accessibility for everyone. Well, in this webinar brought to you by the Accessibility and Landscape Initiative, we'll take uh, we'll talk with some of the region's leading project design professionals to understand the strategies of how we can embrace this critical need. We've heard the talk for many years, but now it's time we take immediate action to ensure our future cities are inclusive and able to meet everybody's needs. And as you'll hear, this consideration goes way beyond any building code or design regulation. The Accessibility in Landscape Initiative is committed to ensuring that pioneering and innovative landscape designs are not only functional, but also celebrate diversity and foster a community of well-being. We thank you all for joining us today. Your attendance says that you too share our passion for greater consideration in accessible and inclusive landscape design. Well, my name's Phil Higgins, and I'll be your host for this webinar. And on behalf of the Landscape Middle East and Landscape Middle East magazine and our managing director, Ziad Amin, we welcome you to this webinar today. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you our panel of guest speakers, and we have quite a few of them for our first webinar. And sitting in Lebanon, hopefully with a really good um, internet connection, which will be very unusual. We have the UNDP Regional Goodwill Ambassador for Climate Action. He's a motivational speaker, professional athlete, a social entrepreneur, and I still don't know what a social entrepreneur is. Uh, he's a legend and an all-round super, super nice guy, my very good friend, Michael Haddad. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. We have the Senior Director for Landscape Architecture at Red Sea Global, Mr. Marlon Van Maastricht, and the director of Cracknell, Hani Bishada. Representing the International Federation of Landscape Architects, we have the very famous Dr. Yala Magzumi and the president of the Saudi Society of Landscape Architecture, Dr. Amir Habibullah. We also have joining us the landscape head of department at Aegis Omradia, Giuseppe Franciello, and the Design Director at Gensler, Mr. Steve Vellagrinis. Steve, Steve, Steve is my favorite uh, LinkedIn personality. He's always popping his head up somewhere around the world. And uh, we also have um, the founder of Barat Al Omran, Landscape Planning and Design in Saudi Arabia, Mr. Amro Tabor. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really look forward to your contribution uh, this afternoon. Well, I promised Dr. Jala that this webinar will not be boring. Uh, she said webinars are boring. I said my webinars are never boring. Um, we have a really packed program, and it's going to be a very interesting hour and a, hour and a bit of discussion about inclusivity and accessibility in landscape. As each of our each of our guests brings a very brief introduction on this important um, initiative. Well, to open up our panel discussions today, I'd like to um, invite Michael to come and speak with us. And then following him will be just a quick run through of our speakers making a comment or a brief presentation about a project where they've used or utilized um, efforts to be more considerate of accessibility. Following that, we're going to have an open panel discussion where we will answer your questions and a few of my own in an open roundtable discussion. So you can submit any question that you have with the Q&A section on the platform. So please, um, as we progress during the, 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 the hour, send us your questions and we will do everything that we can to answer them. If you have a specific question for one of the panelists, you are allowed to answer ask that question. Whether, whether he or she answers the question, I don't know, but ask the question anyway. So with that, um, I, I, I want to keep moving ahead very quickly. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I, I hope your internet connection hangs in there for the, 
for the hour. It's wonderful. I, I understand that you just have returned from uh, from uh, Italy or Rome. And so please just uh, share your thoughts as we enter into this in, into this webinar. First, again, I want to thank all of you for, for participating in this important uh, webinar. I want to thank you, Philip and Landscape Magazine, Triad and all the team for uh, pushing this forward all through your conference and taking it from COP28 and stepping with this topic, bringing everyone together so that we could put the corner stone when it comes to accessible landscaping. And uh, if I am to give a very short comment or an idea to kickstart this conference or this panel, is that we have to think responsible into the future. The future is very fast. The future is very near. Until this moment, there is more than 16% of the population that is marginalized and non-existent when it comes to our thinking, especially when it comes to landscaping. So one, yes, we are into sustainability. And yes, sustainability and inclusion go hand in hand. We cannot have sustainability without inclusion. And it's the other way around. So if we are the world leaders today, stepping into the future, teaching the world how to build up with leaving no one behind, it is thinking sustainable and thinking inclusive. Three things just to wrap up what I said. Uh, a lot of people, when we when we approach people with sustainability, and they think that it is a title that we cannot uh, ever reach. And when we say inclusive, we all have this title. But when we when we go in, inside the content, the content is nearly absented. So I think, and having said that, it's time for us to join hands together, so that we could put a baseline on how to move forward and a baseline how to connect inclusive architecture, inclusive landscaping into sustainability. So if we are looking to 2030, and this is where we, we are all promised to meet certain goals that are related to our survivals as a human being, we have to think inclusive. And to wrap also up, as a part of inclusive de design, as a very important part, is landscaping. Landscaping is not only, and this is what I have learned thanks to you, and especially thanks to my important meeting at Let's See, at Let's See it's not only about green spaces, it's not only about students and, and playgrounds and accessibility, it's not only about the person, it's also about connecting airport to airport. It is the connection between roads and buildings. It is a connection of includes, including everybody in our thinking from the first step, step, in our implementation process, and also in having the ball roll again. Thank you so much. I don't want to take a lot of time. I hope that these three points is a kickstart for our, con uh, for our conversation. And I hope that this conversation will 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 start a snowball that will will grow bigger 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 with tangible results thank you so much again and looking forward to the rest of this panel together thank you so much michael and uh, we really appreciate that you've taken the time to to join with us today um i'd like to ask uh dr jala magzumi to join us uh, she is uh, representing the entirety of the international federation of landscape architects so Yala, why don't you uh, take some time to uh, share your thoughts today on this subject? Well, um, uh, greetings all, evening, morning. Um, thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking Michael Haddad for so bravely pushing this issue forward. And I'd also like to thank um, Landscape Middle East for taking the initiative up. Uh, going back to Michael, I, um, I, I, my knowledge of um, accessible landscape is rather limited. So I did a little bit of a 
of a search to look at what, and there is a lot of material. Uh, and the material falls into two categories. One of them is really the legal and institutional bylaws and so on. And the other is the designers, which is very much the subject of our talk today. And there are really two conclusions. First of all, there is a very important epistemic change to the concept of disability, namely to, to think of it not as a problem to solve, but rather uh, as an, a challenge that we have to take. Uh, and in fact, a lot of authors use this slash ability because why normalize the able and look at the disabled as an oddity. It, it should really be much more open and, and hence the accessible landscape. And um, uh, one of the references, um, uh, David Giesen, who is an architect, but a disabled architect, said something. He says his rallying cry is nothing about us without. And this is really, we're very lucky to have Michael with us because Unless you are disabled or within that category, and I'm very close to being within that category because of my age, uh, it, it's really important to be able to, to think about social norms and how to change them. It's not just design. It's people and how they think of uh, um, a disability and how we can look forward to this, um, uh, to, to this challenge as designers. I will conclude with a news which nobody knows, not Philip or Ziad or Michael, but I've just secured permission to have a special panel on accessible landscape following from today's event in the IFLA World uh, Congress that will be held in Istanbul in September. So I will uh, make sure that you know more about this and I hope a lot of you will join in on that event. So like Philip said, this is a beginning, I hope. And there will be many more actions and initiatives. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jala, and congratulations on that. That's a fantastic opportunity for you. Yeah. Uh, you. You did ask me to go to Istanbul to visit you there. You're making it difficult for me to say no. So... Uh, thank you so much. And um, we do wish you the best and we look forward to hearing from you uh, a little bit further. Um, the president of the Saudi Society of Landscape Architecture, Amir Habibullah, has been a fantastic support for our events uh, with the Landscape Awards uh, last year. And we've got some very exciting news for you again soon. Um, but uh, Amir, why don't, you, uh, why don't you share your thoughts today? Okay, so good afternoon. And as Jala said, good morning to some people. I would like to introduce someone dear to me, honestly, here. And this person in this picture is Carl Lewis. He's a full-time design studio faculty member with disability at the University of Illinois at Bayern Champaign. And I had the privilege of having Carl as my instructor and academic advisor during my master's studies. And I learned firsthand about accessibility from him. Carl was an expert in accessibility and made significant contribution to the Americans with Disability Act. He was my first direct encounter with someone with disability. So despite using a wheelchair, he was active and able to move around the buildings and campus. He even took us for a tour uh, around the building. And, and the question was always in my mind how he was able to do that. And the answer was what's quite simple. Our town, university, and buildings and facilities were designed to be accessible to all people. Unfortunately, Carl passed away last year. But there is a really nice article written by one of the professors about him. So as a landscape architect taught by a person with disability, I feel a strong obligation to contribute to this cause in any way I can. I believe that through collaboration, research, design, implementation and ongoing evaluation, we can create urban landscapes that promote accessibility, inclusivity, and sense of belonging to all. Uh, and I did a lot of work in the past few years about uh, about disability with my colleagues. I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to show you the areas that I was working on. So I focus on research, design, and evaluation. Uh, some articles research about accessibility in residential public spaces, 
where we thought that we need to evaluate uh, the equal access to public spaces. We did design studios where we asked students to go and evaluate uh, public spaces using experiment and uh, asking asking them to uh, to feel how their uh, special needs feel when they are navigating and exploring the sites. And we come up with design solution for that. But honestly, I, w- I really want to focus on uh, at the end is a manual. I built, uh, it's called Universal Accessibility Built Environment. It really showed the vision of our leader, Saudi Arabia. And just give me a few minutes to read uh, what is written here, which is the purpose of uh, this manual. So it said the vision of His Royal Highness Sultan bin Salman bin Abdulaziz, he's a son of the King Salman, is that all people in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia can fully participate and live independently in society with access to public and private spaces for the purpose of education, employment, health, leisure, and all other needs of daily living. And to achieve this vision, the kingdom is embracing the evolving philosophy of universal accessibility, which promotes the concept of designing for all people. And this manual has a lot of technical design requirements necessary to achieve this uh, universal accessibility. And it's good for architect, engineer, interior designer can use this uh, manual. Although I didn't have the chance to examine it very carefully, but having such a manual really helped designers uh, to design public spaces. A, a lot of focus on Saudi Arabia as we move forward in this discussion. I, one of the reasons being that we are building entire cities in Saudi. And um, one of the companies that is leading the charge here is uh, is the is the Red Sea Global. And today we are very pleased to be joined by Marlon uh, from the from Red Sea Global. He is the Senior Director of Landscape Architecture at Red Sea. And uh, I've already seen his presentation, and I know that you will be amazed at what is going on in Saudi Arabia for Red Sea. Marlon, thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. So please thank you for, for inviting me and... Um, Accessibility is, is very important for, for Red Sea. It's high on our agenda and it's very close to our hearts. Um, I have a, 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 a lengthy presentation of which I'm going to give you the, the short version. Great. Um, so I, I met Michael myself uh, last year at the Landscape Middle East Awards. And subsequently, we also heard um, uh, our group head of design, um, uh, Scott uh, Henshaw, speak a little bit. Uh, has has uh, uh, met up with um, with the guys on the uh, on the climate action walk, and Michael has visited subsequently our offices, and and basically got the grand tour also in in support of the initiative, and and also as a show that this is indeed a very important subject for us at Red Sea, uh, as our CEO mentioned, and as we heard in the verse just now. Uh, 1.3 mil- billion disabled people globally. Um, so it's it's not only inexcusable for us as an industry to exclude so many people, it's also crucially short-sighted. Now, um, Red Sea has a pledge for full accessibility across our, our destination. And um, this goes beyond just going for one code. ISO is a very important one. ISO 2190T, two for uh, accessible tourism. But we go beyond that. Most of our assets were already designed as, as ADA compliant. But we as Red Sea, because we are developing new destinations to a new standard, for us it's, it's important to go beyond that. And the Saudi building code, for example, is sometimes more detailed and um, it goes further. But just to show you um, that for Red Sea, it is it is important from start to finish. Um, I've taken an audit, which I will definitely not go into detail, but it's a full audit of one of our already open uh, destinations, which is the Southern Dunes, which is really a desert, uh, in the desert destination. So you could imagine that that would be already challenging in terms of the surfaces and and accessibility. I'll just show you roughly on a high level that as a company internally, we have created a culture of continuous improvement. So 
every time that we deliver a project, when we're planning it, when we're designing it, but especially when we're opening it, we look again at our performance. And uh, because three of our assets, four including the uh, um, the airport, have just opened, in all fairness, uh, only, let's say, after a year when enough visitors have come, we can do these these rounds of, of lessons learned and we update our design guidelines, our standards um, as we go. But we are fully committed and this is some of the aspects of that journey. So it starts from your arrival, in our case, at the Red Sea, at our Red Sea airport, which has opened already operations. Um, then from, from the airport to our destinations, whether uh, inland or on islands, um, from when you arrive at the destination, obviously the journey to your, your guest rooms and then um, the leisure activities or amenities. So I'll, I'll just show you kind of how, uh, not kind of, I'll show you what an audit, an ISO audit would entail in all these various aspects. And in some cases, even at Red, also at Red Sea, we are not perfect, but it's important that we that we diligently review that we take our lessons learned and that we take that on board in uh, in our continuous improvement. So, in terms of accessibility, this starts from boarding um, uh, your your transit from and to the airport and the communication itself. So, for example, in our case, uh, um, we could do it even better uh, by having, for example, an, uh, an FM system. So that um, uh, users of of, uh, of special needs, for example, with implants, could actually switch to uh, to their phone to get additional information. Um, so these are some of these things: the written communication, the graphics, uh, the symbols. Um, be, uh, of course, the escalators and moving walkways, and when we change from one floor to another, is very important. To then. The example in this case, this is the Southern Jewel, um, which is, as I mentioned, is in the desert. It's a desert experience resort um, uh, operated by Six Senses, uh, in which you have a central arrival up, which you see to my right. It's an oasis uh, connected to hotel rooms and then a, a corridor that moves you uh, through, the, through the desert dunes to a central amenity hub which has a restaurant and a swimming pool, two private villas. So I'll just walk you through that, that journey that I uh, mentioned just now, those four, uh, four aspects of it, and, um, uh, and I'll show you um, uh, how these aspects come into play, some of these, of course, not uh, in, in full detail. But when you approach to the, to the building, uh, are you coming by motor vehicle, um, in our case, in all assets, this is the case. You're being dropped off by our own dedicated transport system. Um, but then upon arrival, how are you received? Uh, in our case, we do not need a specific ex uh, uh, accessibility parking, for example, because we have a no-car policy. But these are all things that we take into account. And then, of course, the corridors to the building, are there ramps, steps, uh, uh, are there uh, additional supporting facilities how about in case of emergency, accessible for ambulance persons? Um, all these things come into play to making this experience as seamless for our, for all uh, user groups. The entrance itself, right? Easy identification of the boundaries of the sites, um, uh, the entrance doors, uh, uh, alternative entrances, so and so forth. In our case, in Southern Jones, you actually arrive in a central oasis and as you can see everything is on the same level so from the moment that you are dropped off straight into the um the corridors that take you or the central oasis that takes you to the reception and also we have a a, a birth uh an birth lab and an art gallery straight away but as you can see and i'll show you later on this actually connects to uh, our key amenity straight off the bat and it's on the same level these are some of the aspects, so I'll not go into, into detail, but this is maybe more interesting. You can see the planning. It's not just planning and it's, uh, sorry, it's not just design and engineering. It's the planning itself. So you have a central oasis 
And around this, all our uh, amenities are there from meeting rooms, from your uh, uh, day-to-day dining, um, spa entrances, um, and going to the lower lower floor. Um, you can see in the center um, are, are actually elevator, fully accessible elevators, so that it's also easy to move between floors. So this is an image of that central hub. Um, and inclusivity has also to do with not just um, uh, with disabilities or special needs, also in terms of the general public in, in comfort. So you can see with our shade uh, structures, this entire oasis is, is comfortable uh, to all users and fully connected. So again, the roots within, how do these different functions connect to each other? I will not go through all the details, but we go through a list of basically assessing and validating and improving all these to have that maximum accessibility. Some of the further images, um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to browse, just browse through this. Some of the, um, um, you know, the smaller amenities like your ice cream stand along the way. And then going from that central hub, um, going to your your hotel room so this is already straight away connected as you can see in the upper right of the plan um so from the oasis you're able in in wide corridors and seamless transitions you can see that the doors themselves are very wide so there are all these parameters that we have to um we have to take into account in order to basically include every category of user which we have as you can see and again, without going into detail, that most of these boxes are ticked, but we are also aware where there's still room for improvement um, and accessibility from the entrances, the doors, the windows, the R-suite bathrooms, as you can well imagine. This is the plan, for example, of uh, a king and a twin room, where you can see that the corridors to the bathrooms and outdoor to the terrace are all fully accessible. And then uh, last but not least, I'll just I'll just move um, uh, very quickly to some of those. I mentioned the fact that these amenities are there. I'll just browse through, but just take note of the transitions from indoor to outdoor. There, there is no, no level changes, no steps, no, no ramps even necessary. So it's all on the same floor. And this is even on the outside of the oasis, from the meeting rooms to the outer corridors, um, to the dining areas, dining itself. Uh, for example, if you were using a wheelchair um, or you have special needs, it's important that the furniture themselves, the access to buffets and the service that we provide is customized in order to create um, uh, an optimal experience. And that obviously there's enough space to move around both indoor and outdoor. Um, so I'm going to pick up the pace a bit, so otherwise we're going to run out of time. And, and another one that deserves mention is, for example, the swimming pool area. So you, you are being um, transported from the oasis um, to this uh, amenity hub um, uh, by dedicated transport. And then it's obviously import, in pla- important in plan um, uh, and in details that all these corridors are freely accessible and um, uh, easy to use. And then in this case, what is a very nice detail is that um, the upper part of the pool that you see is actually done as if it was a, a an ocean um, uh, that I beach. So you can actually, it, there's a ramp in there that creates a seamless access, which is also one of the important uh, parts of, uh, let's say, at the amenity side. Obviously, you can imagine beach, beach frontage, boulevards, but also pools themselves. So... In this case, our pool area is fully accessible and one could even take a wheelchair and just uh, ride straight away into the pool. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it with that. It's, again, in, in conclusion, it's a, it's, a, it's a detailed process. It's an ongoing process. I just wanted to show you different aspects of that, very high level without going into detail. But as I mentioned, Red Sea is very much committed to continue improving and also to lead the way into making any and every destination as accessible and inclusive as possible. Merlin, thank you very much. And I, I know you've got so much to cram here. And this is the first webinar in a series that we hope to bring to the uh, to the landscape community uh, uh, about this subject. And uh, 
I hope we could call on you in the future to maybe just take an entire hour and talk to us about what's going on at Red Sea. So thank you very much. Um, let's move on to another land- a, 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 lands- a landscape, a company in Saudi Arabia that has for, for many years developed a very healthy reputation as a reputable designer of architectural services. Um, Omrania is is based there, and I'm sure a company that is experiencing uh, substantial growth in the last couple of years. Well, I'm, I'm sure Aegis hopes that as well, seeing that they bought or partnered with the company um, uh, to, to move forward with fantastic uh, opportunities in Saudi Arabia. Giuseppe, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what Aegis is, what Aegis Omrani is doing in Saudi Arabia today. So I would like to basically show a few, just few uh, slides regarding a project that we are involved as Omrania and uh, Edges Group. And uh, <clears throat> the message here is more about how with small uh, gesture we can make a you know, big difference. And uh, also talk, I would like also to use this project as an opportunity to talk about uh, inclusive design, which for us is, as a, as a Marini and as you, as edges is very is very important. Um, the project uh, that uh, I'm showing now it's uh, regarding the public realm for Kaft, which as you everybody probably know is the financial district uh, in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, which started the construction in 2006 and still uh, ongoing. And basically, the client requested uh, Omrania to investigate the level of uh, accessibility implemented in the in the design so basically what we did we in, we, we conducted a, a very extensive investigation from an accessibility point of view evaluating in detail uh, the level of complying with the SBC code and ICC code but this was just a, a starting point as an opportunity to then uh, try to uh, introduce or propose a design strategy in order just not only to comply with the code, but also to improve the quality of the design. So as you can see in this slide, this, we, we presented this in a very simple way with uh, on, the, on the left, uh, the actual status and on the right, uh, the, 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 design, the design strategy that we were proposing. And uh, the... You know the gestures are very simple, but the impact can be very, 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 uh, very big. Uh, implementing new benches to be integrated with the existing uh, planters, improving the, the 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 level of the softscape, introducing some artifacts, and uh, and improving also the, the in general the quality of uh, of the of the materiality. Uh, but in other case, just introducing uh, simple uh, simple elements like a proper rubber ramps and uh, additional uh, additional benches so in order to again improve uh, from a, an accessibility point of view but also at the same time from a, a design quality uh, point of view uh, in other areas of this uh, of kaft uh, like in this case the, the the inner ring which is the loop around around kaft we just try to improve the accessibility and the quality of the space uh, of course improving the softscape but also opening to different users uh, like in this case runners or people that want to use the bike to go around the, around the, around the site and in other case like in this particular area the accessibility and the ge- in general and the quality of the design in general can be also improved introducing uh, in a certain way uh, artifacts uh, which probably g- g- Im- can uh, Im- improve the quality of the design and uh, in this case uh, uh, we're also improving uh, the the activation so try to activate uh, in a more efficient way the uh, the space and uh, these slides is also about uh, how we uh, can try to improve the the the, the existing uh, design just introducing uh, uh, not introducing new elements but improving the existing elements like in this case uh, planters uh, which uh, we are trying now to uh, modify introducing uh, these build up planters which create an opportunity to introduce more seating or 
uh, basically separate the um, the pedestrian circulation from the vehicular circulation and creating also a better uh, approach to the crossing cross, crossing roads. So here the message uh, that we would like to convey is that uh, mm, ac- accessibility is not just a matter of code or applying the code in order to uh, comply with uh, with uh, with the um, with the, the with the code and the, and the, um, and the regulations but it's also about uh, using uh, uh, accessibility as an active part of the design process in order to improve the design quality and also most important to expand uh, expand the boundaries of accessibility into the concept of in- inclusive because the space are not it, it should be for everybody. So we should, of course, uh, focus on people with uh, disabilities. But the the, the 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 principle should be that, that we should open to ev- everybody. Just to give uh, an idea of what I'm saying is that if you consider, for example, uh, the osteoarthritis, which is a condition that affects the, uh, the joint, and uh, this can be mild but can arrive to also very serious level uh, which which means that people can have some problems uh, working uh, this osteoarthritis in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia for for example uh, it's interesting it's affecting uh, up to 60% of the population between 66 years and 75 years and is affecting 30% of the population aged between 46 and 55. So this means a very large amount of the population in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So this means that uh, even a very simple detail, like a step, uh, or okay, uh, she, the moment that we approach the detailing of very small uh, small elements, it can, the way how we design it, the way how we think about it, it can be, it can have a very big, uh, big, uh, big impact. So uh, to conclude, the message is that we should think in terms of accessibility as uh, uh, we should think in terms of accessibility for everybody and also that accessibility should be also a very important part of the design process in order to achieve quality. Uh, Giuseppe, thank you so much. Uh, Very, very interesting to see. Um, um, What a great project to bring to our attention one that was already built and yet they uh, have commissioned you to investigate or to research w- what was missed. And that's uh, that has a lot to say about the future uh, for us moving forward. And I'm sure that the uh, the, the efforts to to rectify that were, were quite, will be quite costly. Um, Cracknell is an international uh, landscape firm that has been supporting our initiative uh, from the very first day, joining us on the COP28 walk there with Michael at the end of last year. Um, it, it's been uh, wonderful to connect with them. Um, Hani Bishada has joined us, the director of Cracknell. Um, Hani, uh, why don't you bring to us a, an, a, some insight into what's happening there at Cracknell? All right, so just a small intro before I go into uh, specific projects is when we're looking at the uh, subject of accessibility, we look at it as uh, hand-in-hand working with inclusivity, and you'll realize that on the um, dictionary sort of wording for both, very similar, hand-in-hand. They cover basically um, everything for everyone. So when we're talking about landscape, um, we translated that into two categories. So if we're prioritizing things, step one is safety for everyone. So within landscape, you need to get from A to B safely. Everyone needs to have that from each background everywhere. The other one is uh, to be also added is now that we're moving into more uh, urban areas, civilizations, things like that, then you go into opportunities and resources. So Again, all the activities should be for all. Uh, within speaking about the landscape context, this would include um, uh, so, um, play areas, uh, swimming pools, everything, leisure or otherwise, that would fall under the category B. So direct examples, and we're going to show some 
pictures to showcase that is you've got for the uh, safety uh, for all sorts of, I wouldn't call them actually disabilities. Again, I would call them general challenges. Everyone has their, might be physical, might be psychological. I know people with dyslexia. So the, there are a lot of things to consider there. And the more you research into it, the more interesting it becomes. And the more you see that if we take positive steps, it is all achievable and fit for all. So you've got ramps and tactiles and everything that you touch and go and feel and you'll find that there is an opportunity to, uh, with a little effort, to uh, go a long way. Then you face the indirect benefits. And the indirect benefits, uh, they cover a, a huge bracket with regards to the social behavior, the tolerance, um, increased awareness among soul, um, happiness, the level of content, and the well-being of all individuals and communities alike. course there would be in some instances as you go an extra mile sometimes to make something fit for all is there will be a little bit of a cost or capital cost in the, for, for projects for landscape areas for construction and uh, these uh, this is one of the challenges now in order to address that um, how what steps do we need to take the first one is similar to that webinar that we're having now and other uh, initiatives such as the, the one that was in COP28 I'm sure there are a lot more by uh, IFLA and other agencies and we can have it through is uh, increase the awareness uh, talk more about the topic increase the awareness of everyone about the topic and that it is doable it is easy uh, just have to put our heads together and get it done so um, most most importantly those three parties, which is the uh, landscape industry, consultants, contractors, specialists, all alike, institutes, and uh, from the very beginning, uh, uh, during education, developers, and governments and uh, legal authorities. So if we include all of those and they are aware of the subject and put our hands together to address it, uh, this would come through different uh, initiatives um we got the from the government how you can give incentives to developers who adhere to those initiatives prerequisites credits similar to sustainability so we were talking about that in the beginning that works hand in hand with sustainability um then it, you can utilize that for marketing and awards so the more inclusive your project or your city or your development is then you are announcing that uh, you're being I mean, in pride. Um, then you've got the uh, consultation, ongoing research, because there's always something new. There's always something to know more, to advance and to improve on. Speaking about the first one, just in, we're here within where we are, which is Dubai. Uh, we've got the Dubai Universal Design Code, which is an accessibility checklist. And this is a great initiative. It is rather recent. And I'm looking forward for that to be uh, kind of a prerequisite for all projects or a uh, mandatory uh, element. Uh, you've got uh, within KSA, you've got their uh, side of building code and uh, other uh, codes. USA, of course, we followed the ADA on a lot of our projects. Uh, UK and Ireland, you've got also the uh, Equality Act and ADA. So with regards to projects in particular that we have uh, considered uh, inclusivity and accessibility requirements within, one of which was, uh, it's a hotel park in Doha, close to the old Sheraton, and it uh, hosts a four-story car park right beneath it. And all areas within this project are accessible within ramps to standard handrails, double-height handrails, um, or uh, different needs. Play areas have got also inclusivity within them, the selection of play equipment. Then you have sensory parks, and those address four of the five uh, senses, uh, excluding uh, taste. So you've got uh, sound, uh, smell, touch, uh, vision, and you do that through 
different aspects of uh, the sensory gardens, uh, whether it's play, whether it's uh, texture, uh, light, and uh, so on and so forth. Thermal comfort, and this is where one of the aspects where there's a crossover between sustainability and inclusivity, where you've got shade by trees or otherwise. Again, uh, not everyone can sustain long walks in in uh, sun special in summer heat in this part of the world. Uh, so, um, putting uh, some sort of standard to that, we started with sustainability, fifty percent shade. We can improve on it. We can keep it. This is considering things fit for all, safe and comfortable. Uh, also, if you consider other elements, which is uh, tactile, not only blisters at uh, stops, but uh, corduroy and other sorts of tactile, we've gone through the whole thing and a lot of infrastructure projects per se, uh, um, uh, signage and the contrasting colors. So colors play a huge or partially sighted uh, individuals and uh, tactile, again, partially side of blind, handrails, ramps. You've got comfort within studies, so seating, uh, what is the uh, ideal distance between outdoor seating uh, or uh, furniture areas? So every 100 meters you have a bench. There are, again, standards for those. Four different age groups, elderly, everyone, um, Lighting levels, comfortable lighting levels, doesn't mean you over light. It's safe, it's comfortable, and easing the eye. And again, there is not only the uh, physical disability, there are other forms of disability. Or, again, challenges, we call them, uh, that with a little bit of effort, it's fit for all. Um, with this, um, I would end the slide deck, but with a small note that yes, we do do individual, we do carry individual efforts on our projects and our individual areas, uh, all disciplines. But uh, what we perceive is we can do a lot more. We uh, don't think we're as of yet doing enough. This webinar is one of the first few steps to do more and uh, to reach our common goal. Uh, and I, I mean, I really want to see this move forward. We have it in the checklist as an NOC, see everything happening and become part of a community that uh, addresses this as a priority uh, on all projects and uh, community planning uh, initiatives. Uh, thank thank you. you very, thank you very much, Hani. Appreciate, uh, appreciate that. That's uh, good to see that uh, Cracknell is, uh, has this as part of their foundation. So wonderful. Um, our next, uh, our next quick presentation is from um, Stephen Velagrinis. He is a director at Gensler. Stephen, I'm, I'm not quite sure if you know, but uh, a few months ago, I interviewed Diane Hoskins, and uh, I was just amazed at uh, at at the scope that Gensler has worldwide. At the end of that one hour, I was hoping she was going to ask me to come and work for her. I would do anything to work for Gensler. And so you have a great job. I'm sure you just love working for your company, but why don't you tell us what's happening in uh, in Gensler for landscape and accessibility uh, considerations today? Thanks, Phil, and, and thank you. I, I heartily agree Diane's an inspirational uh, person and someone who sort of takes a personal interest in a lot of the things that we do despite, you know, being a uh, managing director of a 7,000 person company. Um, but I think that, um, I'd, firstly, um, I would echo a lot of what's been said by him. We have to sort of um, think very broadly about uh, about accessibility. Um, in some of the ways that have been outlined by everyone who's been speaking today, so initially um, I, I was looking through projects to show that, and I sort of decided instead to tell a personal story. Um, and I think because a lot of our design thinking is, is shaped by personal experiences, um, you know, looking at the way people use spaces, um, listening to, to your friends or family tell you about their frustrations, it teaches us a lot as designers. Um, and my sort of personal story um, really starts uh, in, in 2020 when that COVID had just been discovered. I contracted COVID and lost about 70% of the hearing in my left ear. 
Um, so since then, I've been sort of adjusting to life with a hearing impairment, um, which I never actually imagined would be something that has a spatial component. But um, it, it's become it's become a, a quite profound uh, element of the way that I see things. Um, it, 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 there are simple components to it. Obviously, you struggle to hear people, um, but there's also spatial components where um, if you stand in a, in a lift lobby um, and you wait to hear the D sound, when you have a hearing impairment, especially an asymmetrical one, you always look in the wrong direction when you hear that sound. Um, and, and it's through things like that that I've, I've started to understand my own issues, but also that everyone has has quite unique issues. Um, and, and I feel pretty fortunate. I've got most of my faculties and, and abilities, but it does actually make you start to think about what everyone's particular needs are. And I, I really sort of echoes this idea that let's stop thinking about disability um, and, and just sort of think about everyone has a different perceptive um, uh, sort of approach to the world. And how can we address more of those needs? Um, because that's really what we need to do. It's actually, des- we're designing a human landscape and no two humans are the same. Um, when we sort of think about accessibility, our mind almost inevitably comes to things as landscape architects designing public realm, where we think about things like um, footpaths and ramps and how um, physical access um, is impacted in the landscape. But there are so many uh, different uh, needs that people have when it comes to landscape uh, or, or, or the public realm of our cities. Um, when, when we sort of, I think it's easy for everyone to understand the idea of, of our footpaths and how, you know, a change in level uh, between one property boundary and the next or an uncoordinated paving really impacts people that have issues with sight or issues with mobility. Um, but we don't often think about other forms of accessibility. So in, in my personal case, you know, hearing, um, the, the, the ability to sort of perceive your uh, surroundings acoustically. But we also need to think um, in, in broader ways, like if you're, if you're older, um, then do you need more, more chairs uh, every, every so often in the, in the urban landscape? If you're a woman, um, how how do you feel in terms of safety in a public space? That's also part of accessibility. Um, you know, we, we, we have to think about uh, the broadest possible range of abilities and concerns uh, in the landscape. Um, so that, that gives us a really difficult task as well. You can't know um, everyone, every user's needs uh, at the time you're designing it, but you can you can actually estimate what a lot of people will, will need. Um, and we need to think um, quite purposefully about that idea, about um, I'm thinking about the, the mother with a trolley, a person in a wheelchair, an older person with limited mobility, someone with an acoustic uh, uh, issue, somebody that, that uh, quite simply uh, just has uh, normal difficulties in mobility. Um, and And... As designers, we're often quite um, removed from those people. We don't often, particularly in the Middle East, where we're working on large public realm projects, we don't get that contact with with people to be able to make specific design interventions. So the challenge is really quite great for what we have. Um, I, I I think I really only understood that partly when when I myself had 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 an impairment, but also uh, working on the, the public realm design at Dubai X. Um, that was a, a public realm designed for 25 million people to pass through in six months. And so um, a lot of those issues came to bear uh, at those moments. Some of the most profound sort of uh, uh, learning points were, again, instances where I spoke to people. Um, and I think uh, I, I did notice that in our... In our uh, Listeners, Jeff Sanderson uh, was one of those people uh, who, who spoke to me at length about his frustrations being a six foot eight, seventy five year old man with a couple of uh, a couple of hip replacements and a and a dodgy knee. How uh, just places to sit 
were so critically important for him and how frustrated he got with how um, how most seating is not designed for a, a, an accessible sort of use. Um, but, but equally, it was, you know, talking to someone with a vision impairment who sort of says, well, you know, contrast, visual contrast is so important. Um, and and when, when you work in a scenario like that, it does become critical that you're open uh, to everyone's uh, particular issues with moving through public space. Um, so th- there are there is there is a really broad range of things that are people's immediate concerns. We also have the the ongoing concern of how do we ensure wellness in our city. So not just deal with issues that people have, but how do we actually promote health? Because uh, that's also a question of accessibility. Um, And, you know, we often sort of think about health and wellness as hospitals and medical centers, but clinical care is only 10% of what impacts our health. 90% of what impacts our health is things in the environment, you know, and that could be from what we eat to the quality of air uh, to the amount of exercise we get because the place is connected or not. So there's a sort of dimension that comes in addition to, to addressing people's specific needs with how do we actually give people the right environment that ensures that they have a good level of health, the life that they have. Because ultimately, that's what we should be doing. We should be ensuring that people's life is better, uh, not just per, for people who have a special a special need, but also people who, who just simply want to go about their daily lives. Um, so... There is there is sort of an importance to health that we need to think about as landscape architecture, uh, as a profession. The, the, our job is to really ensure people's health and well-being. Um, and, and so you, you brought it out from accessibility again, of not just impairments that people have, but health that we need to guarantee. Um, so you can expand out again. And I know that this, this becomes overwhelming, especially for a young professional. How do I address all of these things? Um, we, we actually have to think about the, the health of our environments as well. Um, and so when we think about climate change, and I think um, it was mentioned previously, um, the, the latest IPCC reports um, basically suggest that in Dubai in the summer, in, an ex- in the extreme scenario, we might see a 12-degree increase in temperatures, um, fundamentally impacting our access to nature, to outdoor environments, if we're simply unable to to tolerate those conditions. So um, again, we, we we sort of have this scalar problem. We can't just sort of isolate it to one thing. Um, but that's why, um, and many of the panelists have rightly said this. Um, that's why in- inclusivity is part and parcel of sustainability. It's also part and parcel of resilient design. Why do we try and design places that address the reality of climate change. Um, and it's all part of one thing. Um, and as difficult as that is, we've just got to continually do more to actually say we're addressing all of these things. Um, so in a way, um, the, the entire gamut of what landscape architecture is about is actually about um, accessibility in a way. Um, and that that also could be that that um, as designers, we need to actually start developing uh, our knowledge about it, thinking about how uh, accessibility might be broadened in in its understanding. So um, as I say, this has been a personal journey for me and one that I think that through projects and through people becomes quite profound. Um, And and with that, I want to thank all of the other presenters and and, uh, Landscape Magazine for, for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, next time I meet you, remind me to speak 70% louder. Uh, it's, it's okay. I'm also, I'm also ignorant sometimes, so it's not just the physical impairments. Well, thanks so much. Thanks. Look, our, our, our final uh, discussion today comes from Amro Tabor, and, and, and sorry that you're the last uh, to join our, our panel discussion here. Um, Amro, if you could uh, just bring us up to date with some of your thoughts from Darat al on run landscape planning and design. Um, I we, we really have run a little bit over time and I want to get to some of the questions that we have. 
Um, but I'd very much like to hear a little bit of the farming uh, that you that you and I spoke on earlier. So, okay, fantastic. So, um, um, yeah, I'm I'm actually going to talk about three different projects, uh, and I'll try to uh, you know uh, be within the time limit. So bear with me because I'm going to be a little bit quick. But before I get into the projects themselves, I uh, you know, just a bit of an introduction, and then maybe uh, uh, you know, um, to 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 build upon everything that's been said before about uh, how um, you know when we talk about uh, accessibility, um, you know, the the bigger I guess realm is, uh, and, and the, the 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 bigger word is uh, thinking of individual people and uh, how people are different and, and trying to be inclusive uh, to everyone. Everyone has their own uh, challenges. And, uh, and um, many times those uh, are not, uh, you know, what meets the eye. Uh, a lot of it is in the, uh, you know, in the intangible uh, aspects of our lives or the mental, perhaps, or even the psychological. So, so I'm going to be addressing, um, you know, uh, the notion of designing to break uh, the intangible barriers that set us apart as human beings. The first project is um, an interesting um, problem we got. To the, so we were uh, um, approached by the client uh, who owns this uh, residential compound, and they wanted a design, uh, a landscape design for their main uh, open space. And um, when we started thinking about uh, the diverse community that would be living in this uh, complex, um, we thought of introducing an, an urban farming um, uh, landscape uh, that could perhaps uh, introduce opportunities for all the different uh, categories within such a uh, a community of perhaps 200 people or so. Um, so uh, you know, we we thought about the the barriers that exist between uh, neighbors uh, and then and, and and so on. The barriers that could exist within a family, uh, you know, uh, context between a, a a parent and their children, or a husband and their wives. And we felt that uh, you know, introducing a space that could perhaps uh, penetrate all of those barriers, or or, or perhaps introduce opportunities for. Uh, you know these members of this community to uh, interact uh, would would be a wonderful thing, and um, uh, it was um, you know quite a challenge because you know that's something that you want to uh, approach carefully, and uh, uh, it needs to be accepted by you know that particular community that lives there. So we thought about the grid uh, system. Uh, that would allow, uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, the compound uh, management per perhaps to um, to sort of let allow for this concept to expand or shrink as uh, you know the uh, the level uh, in response to the level of integration or adoption by uh, that community. So, so uh, a grid system and uh, uh, you know uh, an overlay between. Uh, productive landscapes uh, and ornamental landscapes on top through uh, the tree canopies and so on that will also provide produ production uh, protection for uh, those produce and so on. The character of the overall old landscape is, again, revolves around this activity. So, uh, you know, even the, the, the walkways that meander through, um, that meander through those um, uh, planting uh, or um, productive parcels, uh, the, the brown colored here, uh, why the mouse, uh, to allow for accessibility, everything is uh, uh, on the same level. So, uh, and then we have a, a central space here for, again, community interaction uh, and, and so on that we like to call the, the market square. Even the, the playgrounds would be themed around the notion of farming uh, and, and so on. The the expected you know benefits uh, you know will range from the ecological to obviously the interesting or uniqueness of having a farming scene going on uh, within that community. Uh, not to mention even the the cost effectiveness. Things like um, you know uh, um, someone spoke about their safety and security. So 
the mere engage, engagement of the of the community into the outdoors as much as possible will you know reduce the need for uh, monitoring for safety and security and so on. It would be sort of a a, a seamless uh, thing that that's going on. Uh, the recreational possibilities that uh, uh, you know uh, will yeah, and the healing possibilities from such an activity and being engaged in growing your own food, not to mention the the healthy lifestyle and so on. I can go on, but uh, you know, uh, I'll just uh, zip through, and then perhaps we can talk about uh, that in the discussion, or about more about about the project in the discussion. This is a, a different situation, uh, which is also quite interesting. This is a an incubator that is targeting um, um, talented uh, people that, that have um, a content to offer. In the media, and, and this is a public-private uh, initiative in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah. Uh, the incubator targets people with content, as I mentioned. And when again we uh, considered uh, this particular uh, segment of the community, we we uh, we realized that uh, you know um, this is a very sensitive segment of the community. Uh, we uh, in, in Saudi Arabia being. Um, a uh, uh, conservative community uh, have not necessarily been, um, you know, uh, welcoming to 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 this particular segment. These these particular artists or musicians, if you like, have uh, experienced uh, the sense of exclusion or perhaps rejection and so on. So, what we were trying to do in this uh, pocket park, which was originally a loading and unloading uh, uh, space for. For the previous using the, of that building, the building that was retrofit uh, to become an incubation space, um, uh, we decided to to create an, uh, a park or a space for people to to have a more intimate, uh, I suppose, encounter amongst themselves. And uh, we decided, uh, rather than uh, designing the space with scattered seating all around, we introduced a central. Uh, item, uh, what I like to call the intimacy pouch, uh, with the notion or with the idea of uh, trying to bring people closer together and breaking those barriers and allowing for, uh, um, you know, a, a, a networking or sort of uh, having an intimate uh, a conversation between uh, the, the the people uh, who uh, who are visiting the the space, and we've witnessed. Uh, you know, so many magical moments happening uh, between, uh, you know, people uh, just welcoming the artists after they have just completed a performance on stage. Uh, we've heard so many stories of uh, first-time experiences. Uh, the first time we feel this welcome, this is the first time we feel uh, that, you know, we uh, we have a meaning, meaningful uh, uh, mission in life or purpose in life. We have seen parents that are, you know, looking upon their children who have just performed on stage and, and, and have been welcomed by the audience, looking upon their children in a very different way. Uh, so many moments of inclusivity and breaking those, uh, again, mental uh, or intangible barriers that uh, keep us apart as human beings. Uh, we we actually chose to use a fruit bearing uh, uh, plant species around. Uh, just using the, the you know this image of a fruit bearing tree as uh, a symbol for nourishment and a healthy uh, community to be within. Uh, the last project is a uh, university campus or a college campus, I should say. And the problem here was again another interesting one. Uh, the owners of this private college they wanted to present or position themselves as a design institution, but ironically they were not happy with the architecture. At all, so they they wanted a quick solution, an intervention that that uh, could happen within a few months, as the, the the season was about to start, the educational season. They had to launch the project. We could have put a skin on the facade of the building, but we thought of pushing the skin away and introducing a freestanding wall that could uh, introduce a and an, an, you know a hierarchy in the outdoor spaces. But not just that, but that could actually have a life of its own, uh, of being an interactive uh, uh, area for display and projects and, again, uh, a theme or activity 
uh, within the open space that could bring again the the uh, the different communities or the different members of the uh, the college uh, community together. So so again, we think about the, the barriers that could exist between faculty and the students and or or the faculty and and the rest of the staff in in, in the college. Uh, it's an opportunity to uh, in, in, invite parents and the greater community to come and participate in uh, galleries and exhibitions and so on. It also reflects the uh, the mission of the college as a divine institution. Uh, it uh, ultimately uh, uh, it ended up being very inviteful to uh, uh, artistic communities from the outside uh, uh, and being an, an event destination in in, in Jeddah. So. Um, again, I just to close, uh, I'm going to leave you uh, with uh, just the, you know the very important messages that I think that I wanted to to mention here is that landscape design inclusivity should actually go beyond uh, the obvious. The barriers are not always are uh, just the physical barriers that you know that are uh, that we think about. And some um, the soft programming or the activation of the space, as many of as have mentioned before. Uh, are just as important as the, uh, the the design programs, and if not even important. So to to go out, to leave you with this last uh, message uh, to look deeper in in the issue of accessibility and social inclusion, and uh, sometimes the barriers are more than what they seem. While the levels of exclusion can be surprising. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Philip, and everyone for listening. Amara, thank yes. you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Well, we have quite a few questions from the audience. Please submit your questions uh, if you have them. Um, we uh, have we are, we may run a little bit over time, but we will be recording this, and we are recording this, and we will be releasing a video. If you do have to leave us, then we understand. But if you can stick around, I'm sure we're going to have some very interesting discussion. I'd like all of our panel to turn on their video. <coughs> um, Michael Haddad, you'll be the only one excused because uh, it might drop you out. But there you are. We can see you. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I, I've got a few questions and there are several that have been submitted by the audience. And so I'm going to keep this very open. Some of the questions from the audience are directed specifically to people, but do, that doesn't mean that you don't have your say. So jump in. If you have a comment on something, then please, please uh, jump in. So my first question is how do current landscape designs fail to meet the individuals uh, with disabilities? How do we, how the current design, how are we failing? Where, where is the specific need today? Who has some comment on this? I'm going to, I'm going to go straight to, uh, to Steve Velagrinis. What do you think, Steve? Uh, look, I think, um, and I uh, touched on it before, we're, we're, we're inevitably tasked with doing an enormous public realm project with zero contact with users and no ongoing relationship in, in once in once in places to live, and that's always um, that's always uh, paradoxically a handicap for the designer, right? Um, that complete sort of separation uh, from a personal level. Like if you're designing a garden for someone, and that family, you can sit with them and talk to them. You know that that makes it you know, so much easier to address their specific needs. When you're designing for 25 million people, it's, it, it becomes a very different scenario. You have to be able to predict and project, you know, what might be the needs that people have. Um, and I think that um, that's incredibly difficult, especially for young designers. Um, and I think so that the Middle East is sort of unique in having even its smallest projects are enormous by, uh, by other standards. Um, and so that separation between users and designers um, is really, I think, the most difficult thing that we need to deal with. Okay. Um, and you have those difficulties that you face, but everyone's designing for somebody. You have a client, and in that particular case, you have a client, but all projects are designed for a client. What are some of the expectations from the client, and, and do they support your design for uh, for inclusivity? Um Giuseppe, do you have a comment on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, uh, it depends also how we're marketing the, this thing because 
of course, for a client, uh, it's you know it's very financial and business oriented when it comes to invest money. But I think the message there should be that designing for inclusive uh, design and for accessibility is definitely one of the most biggest value that we can give to uh, a project because at the end of the day, especially if we are talking about commercial and public space, uh, activate the space is uh, the final uh, the final target so to make a project successful. Are we seeing developers today uh, uh, excluding uh, Red Sea? Uh, I, I, have, I have a follow-up question here for you, Marlon, so be ready. But um, is... Are we finding that uh, the developers, the owners of projects, supportive today, or or are they just naive to this consideration? I might jump in there because I think that the, there is there is again a uniqueness to our region um, that certainly in our case, most of the developers that we're working for are at least government linked organisations. So yes, they have a financial uh, sort of um, imperative, but they're also much more receptive to um, social uh, imperatives. And so when uh, a KSA or UAE government decides it wants to go near zero, it's not impossible to, or or not even difficult, I would say, to actually convince a developer that has government links. So it could be a PIA company, it could be a a, a private developer that, that has part ownership by the government. It's very easy to actually say, look, this is a national imperative, we should do this. So I find that um, we, we, in most cases, don't find it that difficult to say, hey, it's a national strategy, we should be doing. Um, but again, I, I think that's very unique uh, to, to our region and to some other places like Singapore, where you have a strong connection between the, de- the private developers and the, and the government. It's very interesting to see that some of that government-led development in Saudi Arabia today is driving some of the success. I've seen uh, strong comments from the OM and Red Sea about uh, designing for uh, for accessibility, for inclusivity from the this from the the the, the larger perspective of uh, of tourism, which is from the airport every, and everything else. Um, um, Marlon, as there's a question here from uh, well, about from our audience, what are, are there incentives for developers in Saudi Arabia or anywhere else in the region, if anyone knows, to support uh, developers going the extra mile? And if not, what what are some of those benefits that you see as a developer? What what does Red Sea see as you know a reason for them to move forward with more consideration in their designs? Well, I'm I'm personally not aware of um, of incentives such as uh, fundings or or discounts as such, um, because as a developer we are already fully committed. And I saw that uh, question from Justine: what what is the actual incentive for us? I think the word incentive is maybe already has the wrong connotation. For us, it's baseline. We do not want to leave anybody behind and our motto is so embedded in our core we we design for people and planet or for planet and people if you want to say it the other way around so we we would like to have a holistic experience for everybody and and therefore we go very far to achieve that as i mentioned in 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 my case study we we are aware that uh, the, that goalpost will continue to move and as we develop new destinations new requirements may de- develop and technologies may also provide opportunities that's almost on a daily basis um so um yeah so so our incentives in the end is to deliver a holistic and inclusive product it's already it's already embedded in 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 what we set out to do what the core of our vision and mission is so um yeah i would say that the incentive itself is going to work knowing that you're doing something for better, for a better outcome. I guess one of the interesting uh, points is that uh, when we're designing uh, with with this consideration, and, and today we're talking about landscape. Well, landscape is just part of the build process where, you know, we still have the building, we have the amenities, we have the airport, we have the road systems, 
but uh, our industry here is is giving close consideration to supporting the you know the the urban parkland that that open landscape uh, space within these developments and it's important that we you know push forward with this agenda to gain some support from the developer and the contractor as 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 well as the entire industry um are we doing enough today is there enough support for inclusive it it's it's easy for us to discuss this we can talk about this but uh, are we really doing enough to um to to support you know those with disabilities i could ask you know the best person to ask this question to is to michael haddad have you visited some parks in saudi arabia when you when you're there and are we doing enough to support those that that are in a wheelchair and who don't have the opportunity to walk like you do are we doing enough for those with hearing uh, difficulty? Uh, sorry, are we doing enough, uh, Stephen, for those with hearing disabilities? You know, are we doing enough, Michael? Actually, uh, and bluntly, I will say no. Uh, and this is why we are here. And I would like to point something very important because we have two communities. We have the people with disability community and we have the special needs community. And this, is, this was um, very well highlighted by colleagues that highlighted different types of need and, and connecting all the dots. And based on what I have learned, which is very, very important, and again, thank you for, for this amazing um, webinar, uh, what is missed is also legislation. What is missed is also implementing this type of legislation. I know colleagues uh, mentioned a lot of norms and regulations such as ADA, the ISO, and like, okay, but the first question that comes to our mind, when was the ADA last implemented or last ratified? Most of our laws are like from the 70s and the 80s, and yet we are missing a lot considering what we have in terms of technology which is artificial intelligence, other types of inclusivities. And at the end of the day, we cannot only depend on the client or, or on a certain, uh, 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 let's say, intent to build accessible. You know, we have to put the, the human in the center. And like, I see that today we have this initiative I see, I see that the most part that we are missing is the knowledge sharing. I personally have learned a lot. Uh, I've missed a lot being a, a person that is following on accessibilities, working on uh, with governments on implementing accessibility, uh, connecting different elements. Like a lot of people, when 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 they followed us on on the on the media, like landscaping. What does landscaping has to do in and accessibility. The first question they asked me from like people outside the box. And like today, we we nearly prove to the world that without accessible landscaping, there is no connection on different types of accessibility. So yes, we are missing a lot. Yes, the rules and uh, regulations have they they have to be amended to 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 cope with the future steps. Yes. We must put our arms, uh, we have our minds together to put the knowledge forward. And yet, we have to start putting our hands together, not only private companies, but start working public-private partnerships so that we could use our models in order to inspire others to do more. So... We are far beyond implementing disability is not only people on wheelchairs. We also have different types of disabilities and we also have special needs communities. And yes, it is important for us to put the human in the center. It's important to us to influence decision makers that accessibility and disability go hand in hand. And we are missing a lot when it comes to inclusivity and inclusive architecture, especially if we intend to look into the future and to step into the future.
Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Um, Dr. Shala, you raised your hand there. With, you, you had something to say? Yes, I did. Um, thank you, Philip. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up on what Stephen said about the specificity of the Middle East as in launching maybe the, 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 the largest percent of large public REN projects. So this is definitely where most of the speakers are working and talking. There's another specificity, specificity to the Middle East, which unfortunately is not uh, very positive, and that is war. And uh, there is a lot of uh, disabilities as a result of civil strife and, and war. And I know when I was in Iraq, following the Iraq-Iran war, the government came up in the 80s with specific uh, uh, regulations and guidelines for disability access in all projects. And that was as a result of all those returning from the front with disabilities in Lebanon. Now what's happening in Gaza? So we also have to take that into account so that I, what I'm trying to drive at is that I really find that the Middle East is the ideal place to launch such an initiative. Because when I, as the vice president to the International Federation of Landscape Architects, I was very disappointed that I received no um, feedback to my questions on any directives or action by IPLA on inclusive landscapes. There are projects, but there is nothing within the institution. And this is really the umbrella for the profession. So I hope that we can, together with everything that's been presented here, combine those two aspects of the Middle East and push towards um, accessible landscape. Fantastic. Thank and, you, uh, Yala. What what, we what, what we have right out of time. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say what Michael said. There's a lot of it. It is the definition of what what is accessibility. What does it include? And this is really a sociocultural issue. It's not, it's not something that we deal with only as design. Thank you. Well, we, we've, we've pushed on to an hour and a half, a l very long webinar. Um, many of our uh, uh, attendees have stayed with us. So thank you so much. We will be recording this and we will share it with you. Um, but let's just quickly go around the room very briefly, a few seconds. Um, uh, Giuseppe, how do we move forward from here? What can we do as an industry? What can we do as the, the, uh, the Accessibility and Landscape Initiative do to support uh uh, moving forward, what do you think? But uh, I don't have uh, <laughs> all the answers, but uh, again, uh, I think initiatives like that are very important because the most important thing is talking about uh, and share experience and uh, and ideas. Of course, uh, uh, as as a designer, we 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 have a very uh, important duty, which is basically mm, try to do in our everyday job what we believe it's it's right and uh, of course uh, one of our duty is educate because we are not only designers we are also educators and educators of for simple clients or developers or uh, the people that these are around us so i believe that to con <clears throat> convey a precise message is just a matter to be very persistent and uh, keep uh, uh, op uh, an open discussion and and uh, and share uh, ideas and uh, try to uh, convey the message to the biggest uh, audience. Um, we, well, with that in mind, we have two educators on our panel, Amro and Amur. Amur, what are we doing today uh, with this next generation of architects? Is this a matter of uh, of uh, consideration in their in their uh, in their education? Uh, thank you, Philip, for uh, for this question. I think. Uh, in terms of education, in terms of research, there's huge gaps in, in research about accessibility in both areas. But as an educator in, uh, in our university, we, as, we are at the landscape market. We are, by nature, we think about people. So in our design, we design spaces to be accessible. But the question here, when we think about today's presentation of this webinar, all the projects are large-scale projects with huge funding. And the people who are designing those projects are landscape architects. But when we go to the like like smaller level, local level, 
the, uh, the neighborhood parks in Saudi Arabia, for example, who are, dis- who are the designers of these spaces? Mostly they are not landscape designers. And usually they are not even designers. They are from agricultural department or other department. They are just making something to make it green. But they are not thinking about design. And this is for us in Saudi Arabia the most important issue that we really need to hit. The number of landscape architects in Saudi Arabia are, are few, but they are limited. And we are not like decision makers in all these projects. So then, how can we do it? We need to share knowledge. As, uh, as I heard from our guests, we need to collaborate. So those designers who are working, landscape designers working on big projects, they can also help uh, to, to spread their knowledge so we can uh, go to the, uh, the, the public level. This is what I'm thinking. Those projects, like for example, Resi, Young, they are for, or, or Get Day Up, they are for limited audience. Uh, and those people will visit those sites for a short time period. But I'm looking for, uh, for the normal people who are using, they want to go outside for a walk in a public space in a garden. These spaces really need attention. Thank you very much. Um, very yeah. good answer. Um, Amber, Amro, sorry. Uh, what what do you see in your in your sphere of connection? Are we are we doing enough to support uh, this promotion within the next generation? I think uh, Michael answered that bluntly, and uh, you know, you kind of sort of uh, um, you know uh, made us aware that there's a lot more to be done. But uh, at the same time, I, uh, I I I believe that we we are on the right track. Uh, you know, and when I when I connect between this uh, sort of this amazing webinar that we're having in this conversation and and the diversity of the participants that you know are 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 involved, and and uh, also when 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 you look at uh, you know the the government uh, initiatives, uh, the top down initiatives. Uh, again, I speak uh, about Saudi Arabia because this is the domain that I work within. And and uh, it it is being stressed by the government agendas that you know it is all about sustainable uh, you know uh, initiatives. It is about uh, and and definitely inclusivity is a major part of that. It is about the community, a vibrant community. So so there are those drivers from the top down, but also uh, you know from the from the bottom up. Uh, um, you know, with uh, with organizations like uh, IFNA and, uh, uh, and uh, ASLA and so on, having having uh, these uh, NGOs, uh, you know, working closely with the professional community and and, and uh, adopting these agendas, uh, I I think that you know we have the pieces uh, needed in place to to make a difference. Uh, it's just about the the momentum and keeping uh, the momentum uh, and going on. Uh, forward, uh, inclusive design or collaborative uh, design uh, initiatives are could be an amazing vehicle to to uh, address this issue. Making the collaborative design sessions inclusive, so uh, you know, making sure that you you are including all of the diff- different uh, you know uh, um, um, let's say uh, um, uh, types of, of of people that you might be uh, working for or, or uh, designing for. Uh, so yeah, I I think that uh, you know I'm 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 optimistic. I'm I'm hopeful. I think that uh, the more people we have, like uh, Michael and, and everybody here on this panel, uh, I think uh, that you know we will make a difference. Thank you, uh, thank you, Amro, and thanks for joining us. I did have one other question for you, Amro, but I'm going to leave it for another time because yeah. during the presentation, you said that you did a study on the barriers between husband and wife. I'm really curious to see what your results were from that study, um, but I will. Maybe that's another week. We need to talk to my wife about that. I will save that for another webinar. But thank you so much for joining us, um, uh, Steve. You you've had a lot to say today, and uh, I'm sure you could just continue for an entire webinar on your own. Can we get Can we get Gensler back for a an in depth view on this subject again? We would love to. We'd be happy to host something as well. So count us in always. Okay, fantastic. And Marlon, uh, a lot of focus this this uh, day on some of the project developments and the considerations. I'm sure this is a discussion that will continue to evolve. It's our effort that we will continue to allow this discussion to unfold. Uh, so many questions from our audience today. 
an audience much larger than we anticipated. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, but this is the first in a series of webinars that we will use to help promote this discussion. Um, uh, Marlon, um, are you, you've been with Red Sea for a couple of years now. Um, are you seeing this continue to unfold? Are you seeing this subject something that is is going to evolve uh, uh, even further? Absolutely, yeah. I'm all my second year now. It's 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 really high on the agenda. In fact, it's part of our even uh, uh, performance objectives as employee. So that's just how far we go as a company, and we we are very blessed in the sense that we have. Uh, three, four assets now live and, and in continued portfolio of development. So we are at the right time to also uh, be preventative and to update our guidelines and our standards along the way. So every project that we deliver and even discussions like these, we learn something and we try to apply that. So definitely um, to be continued in that sense. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Hattie, thanks for joining us. I didn't overlook. You looked a little bit shocked there. I think you were still thinking about Steve's comment of Dubai's temperature increasing 12 degrees. I think that sort of just caught you a little bit off guard. I don't think I'd like to be in summer 12, 12, 12 degrees hotter than last. But um, but thank you so much for your support and uh, and for that of Cracknell moving forward. Um, we we I, I'm confident that we will do this. You have a brief comment. What what would be the next steps for us to take this forward? Well, from from my perspective, um, we are in young communities around here, so we are an advantage that we're not retrofitting things. In some areas, we can be, but mostly we are. We can implement straight into our projects, which is much more cost conscious and practical. So uh, the faster we move with such initiatives, putting our heads together, legislations, bringing in policymakers. Uh, all authorities, developers, consultants, and uh, speaking to the public, finding out what the needs are, studying more about this, and putting together uh, uh, legal requirement within all projects, the, well, the better it would be for the community. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for those comments, Hani, and thank you to our entire panel. Really appreciate your support um, for this webinar. We look forward to our second webinar where we will further unwrap this subject with a little bit more specificity. We we hope to be looking at uh, the suppliers to the industry um, to support this. Um, you know, companies that might make uh, playground equipment for those with disability or companies that make specialized handrails or seats. There was a very, excuse me, there was a very interesting comment from a viewer. We have handrails in the disabled toilet, but he never sees a handrail on the chair in the park really interesting simple point right and so how do we move forward with these considerations well thank you so much for joining us thank you panel for your time sorry we went over time a little bit um, but it was important an important step forward <clears throat> with this webinar and we look forward to you joining us again in the future well stay tuned for some big announcements coming from landscape middle east in this next couple of weeks we have finalized our next awards ceremony which uh, i can give you a heads up we are heading to saudi arabia so our next awards will be in saudi arabia and it will be a three in one uh, conference expo and awards entire day so we'll tell you more about that as we move forward but thank you so much for joining us and uh, we do wish you a very uh, good afternoon thank you so much <laughs>